give you guys a quick um, review and overview of how to look at uh, carbon-13 NMR. So we'll start with uh, uh, screen share. Um, so all this stuff is posted. I'm actually going to use the um, the compound chemistry carbon-13 chemical shifts to go through this. So actually, uh, let me pull up the, the original NMR slide so we can review how that all works. Um, so remember that this is mainly going to be based on things with an odd number of nucleons because um, things with an odd number of nucleons will respond to a magnetic field. Uh, there's an NMR. All right, so, and that, that happens any time that we have, that we have an odd number of, nucle of um, nuclear particles. Again, that the shorthand for this nucleons. So that's neutrons plus protons. Anytime neutrons plus protons is an odd number, then we get um, we get a nucleus that will respond to the to a magnetic field. And so we're dealing with really, really weak magnetic fields and really, really, and therefore really, really strong magnets. Um, and basically what we can do is if we if we expose them to these nuclei to a very strong magnetic field, they will all align a certain way. They will all align so that they have their magnetic fields all pointing the same direction. And then if we remove the magnetic field, some of them will start flipping back the other direction. Or we can shine light on them and see what, what energy it takes to flip them facing the opposite direction. So if we have a bunch of, of of uh, nucleons that with an odd number of nucleons, nuclei with an odd number of nucleons, um, with no magnetic field, they'll all be arranged randomly. But in a, if you apply a magnetic field, they will all arrange themselves either pointing towards with the magnetic field or pointing 180 degrees. And those two different states have different amounts of energy associated with them. So what we, what we do then is we we align them all with a really strong magnetic field. And then they're all going to, to arrange themselves so that they're at the low energy state. So they're all pointing with the magnetic field. But then we can shine light on them and we can look at the frequency of light that it takes them to switch back the other direction. And so if we shine the light on them, we can get them all into the higher energy state. And then when we turn the light off, they'll all they'll all flip back to the alpha state, to them pointing with the magnetic field. And when they do that, they give off radio waves because the energy that was absorbed to flip them the opposite direction is then going to be re-given off as they flip back the more favorable direction. And so we can actually measure the energy that's given off when they flip back. It's very, very small amounts. Um, the stronger the magnetic field, the greater the, the bigger the difference in these two energy states. So that's why it's so important to get such a large magnetic field because we're dealing with, um, in a lot of cases, we're dealing with really, really small changes in energy, which means in order to make that that's, those changes in energy larger, we can apply a larger magnetic field. Um, and to give you an idea of what this, you know, what, how strong these magnetic fields are. We're talking about even for something that's not as big as a, an MRI machine, um, a, a NMR that you would use in, in an OCAM lab might be something roughly the size of a desk. Um, and there's been cases where if you, have, if you turn one of those on and you have a chair that's made out of metal in the same room, it will wind up if it's if it's an old machine and it wasn't well well shielded enough, you actually can wind up destroying your NMR because you drag your metal chair into the NMR at high velocity. Um, so we're talking about very strong magnets. And so for NMR, this is what we were looking at. So the 
proton NMR specifically, the most common nucleon with an odd number of nucleons is a proton. When we're talking about, about organic chemistry, and I'm actually going to double check the vocab here, make sure I don't tell you this the wrong way. I believe that this is a, yeah. So we're talking about an, a nucleon with an odd number of, sorry, a nucleus with an odd number of nucleons is what's known as a fermion. Anything that has non-integer spin is a fermion to use theoretical physics language for it. So any fermion we can we can take an NMR of and the, use the same principles. Um, and protons are just the most common fermion that we're going to be dealing with. And so proton NMR tells us a lot of information. Um, number of signals is the number of unique protons. Where each signal is, this is this corresponds with the um, the the number of or the the amount of energy it takes when these things flip back and forth between the alpha and beta states is what we're measuring with the chemical shift and that amount of energy is going to be dependent on how shielded how many electrons there are surrounding that fermion so this, we can look at this at chemical shift as a basically how much um, how much electron density is around those fermions, and the more the further to the left they are, that's more de shielded, means that there's less electron density around them the further they are to the left. And again, area under each signal is going to be proportional to the number of protons. So we can integrate this to get the number of protons in each signal. And then we also had to deal with the splitting, right? If it was a tip, if it was a quartet versus a triplet versus the doublet, told us about how many protons were attached next door. So a lot of information in proton NMR. Carbon NMR works very the very similarly, except that carbon NMR, we're actually looking at carbon 13. So most carbons are going to be carbon 12, right? And so carbon 12 is not a fermion. It's a boson, boson. And that bosons can't be measured in NMR. They don't respond to a magnetic field. Fermions that have that non-integer um, spin are the ones that we can actually use to take an NMR up. They're the ones that will respond to a magnetic field. So we can't look at all of the carbons, but about 1% of the carbons are going to be carbon-13. And so if 1% of the carbons are carbon-13, that sounds like a small amount, but we're talking about moles here, right? So 1% of a mole is still a really big number of carbons, right? So we wind up with signals that are weaker, but they can still be measured. Um, and so that's what we're what we see with with carbon thirteen NMR. Um, it works like I said the exact same way, except if you look at the bottom, the chemical shift. We're dealing with a lot larger numbers. With proton NMR, we we're looking at numbers between about. 0 to 12 for our chemical shift. Um, because we're dealing with carbon-13, and carbon-13s are a lot larger, it takes more energy to flip them the other direction, just it because they're heavier. And so we're dealing with larger chemical shifts, even though we have a smaller number of carbons to deal with. Um, and so the nice thing about carbon-13 NMR is that, um, well, I guess it's not the nice thing. There's less information here. Sorry, I lost the figure that I wanted to use. There we go. Um, they don't have any splitting because the only reason we saw splitting with the proton NMR was it was based on how many hydrogens were next door, right? And you had to have the hydrogens nearby in order for those magnetic fields to interfere with each other. For them, they call that coupling. And so for the protons, 
wound up coupling with all the other protons nearby them. But the odds that you have two carbons that are both carbon 13 in the same molecule is pretty small. Unless you're, you've got a, a molecule that is that has 200 carbons in it, the odds that you have two carbon 13s in the same molecule is very, very tiny. And so that means we don't have any coupling between those nearby carbons. So in other words, no splitting. And this also means that since we're not talking about, we don't have a, as large of a number of these carbon 13s, we can't integrate the peaks either. So that actually simplifies things a lot because now all we can really look at is how many unique carbons we have. That's just gonna be the number of signals and where they are will tell you what type of carbon they are. Right, so that's, there's less information there, but the nice thing is, is that most, pro, most um, instruments that can take a proton NMR, all you have to do is change the setting on them and they can take a carbon NMR as well. So you will frequently get both a carbon NMR and a proton NMR of, a, of an unknown, which means that, that you can use the carbon NMR as a way to sort of get an idea, okay, this is how many carbons I'm looking at or how many unique carbons I'm looking at. And then use the proton NMR to sort of hone in on, okay, this must be a CH2, this must be a CH because of the integration or because of the splitting. So we're gonna use them in conjunction with each other on today's assignment. Um, the, the assignment itself is in this first PDF and it's just gonna be some more qualitative analysis. You guys go through, um, I gave you a cheat sheet from, what, from a lab textbook that I've used before. Um, as well as the links to the carb compound chemistry NMR sheets. Um, so this first page just says, okay, here's your approximate proton and carbon-13 NMR shifts. The one on the right, if you look at the PPM at the top, the one on the right is going to be your carbon NMR. One on the left is your proton NMR. And you know, they, they condense this as much as possible so that it, uh, they could fit both of these on one page. This isn't as easy to look at as some of the others. Um, but it does have all the same information. And once again, in both cases, we can tell pretty clearly when we have aromatic rings, right? Proton NMR, that was a, a smoking gun, right? There's only one thing that shows up between about seven and eight and a half. If you had any signal between seven and eight and a half, it was going to be a, a benzene ring. And similar here, you can look at this, okay, between 101 and 150 or so, if you had a signal in there, it was either a, an alkene or a benzene, right? So you can use these two things in conjunction with each other to determine, okay, do I just have an alkene or do I have a benzene ring? Because alkene hydrogens showed up all the way down here, right? So this just gives us another piece of information. And again, just like before, it can be helpful to start by drawing all of your potential isomers. All right, so your, I also gave you the IR, list of IR bands that we've been using in the past. You know a formula, C8H10O, and I give you an IR, a proton NMR, and a carbon-13 NMR, you should be able to come up with the figure, with the um, structure for it. This has all the information you need. And the other thing about it is all, it should all be consistent with each other. If you just look at the proton NMR and you come up with what you think the structure is, but then it doesn't match with your carbon-13 NMR, you must have done something wrong. You're reading something wrong somewhere, right? All of these things have to work together. Right, and again, here's your, your carbon-13 NMR is not going to be nearly as detailed. No splitting, no integration. So you're just looking at the chemical shift and how many peaks you have. So as a as an example, 
we knew the formula given for this one was C8H10O. So I have a total of eight carbons. But when I look at the, pro, at the carbon NMR, you have one, two, three, four, five that are really close together, six, which means some of my, pro, uh, my carbons must be identical to each other. And the fact that we have two peaks showing up right around seven here tells us that we've, we've got a benzene ring, right? And that's a right around the same region where we would see a benzene ring in the carbon NMR. So probably those two unresolved lines are two different types of carbons on the benzene ring. All right, so we can go through this and so, okay, I know there's a benzene ring, draw a benzene ring out. And then look at, okay, now I've got two more carbons to distribute, two more carbons and um, one oxygen to distribute, right? And just draw your possibilities and see what you can make work. Any, any questions at this point? All right, I'll let you guys start working on these and then um, I will find some practice problems for carbon for, that are similar to this that we can work through if you guys wanna see one work all the way through. All right, let me, let's see, how many did I give you? I gave, Maybe a fair number. We can work through the first one together. We'll do the first one on the on the assignment here. All right. So one of the ways that some textbooks will tell you to do the qualitative, um, the qualitative pieces here, is to draw all of the fragments that you know have to be there. So based on what we just talked about, I know that there ha we know that there has to be a benzene ring. Because if I look at, um, if I bring up the figure of the carbon NMR, where did that one go? Here's our proton NMR figure. So I can have this up at the same time as the, There's our proton NMR spectrum. And there's our guide to proton NMR chemical shifts, right? So the only thing that really shows up in that six to six to eight and a half range is a benzene ring. So we know we've got, and the integration on it. tells us that we have um, that there are two things attached to the benzene ring. Because a benzene by itself would be C6H6, right? So the fact that when it's integrated, we get four protons in that region tells us that we've got to have four hydrogens there. Now, we don't necessarily know 100% that there, that the benzene has two things attached on opposite sides. But the fact that we have, we only have two distinct carbons in that aromatic range region, when I go down to the carbon NMR, we only have, there are two unresolved lines at 130 ppm. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, 130 parts per million, Right in here, that tells us that there that's 100 to 150 is benzene. Right, so we have two unresolved peaks at 130. And then we have another peak at um, 100 and one and another peak at right below 160. It's a pretty small peak, but again, we can't always rely on integration for these, the carbon NMR. 
So we only have two hydrogens, but we have a, we have four different carbons in that aromatic region. So we have to find some way that's going to keep all four of our hydrogens. There have two of them have to be the same relative to each other, right? There's only two distinct types of hydrogens out of those four. If we put one of our substituted, put a hydrogen here and put our other R group there, well, that's more than two, two unique types of hydrogens, right? Especially if these R groups are not the same. You've got adjacent to R to R1, but opposite of R2. Adjacent to R2, but opposite of R1. You've got adjacent to both of them, and you've got adjacent to neither of them. That's going to be, give you four signals in the aromatic region, right? So the fact that we only have two signals in the aromatic region kind of hints that maybe our compound is substituted like this, where we have R1 and R2 opposite each other. And we'll see if we can come up with a structure that matches that. So we know we've got a benzene ring, probably para substituted. We don't know that for sure. We'll worry about that later. And if we look at the IR, that gives us a lot of information too, because we know we have to have an oxygen in there. And there are only a couple of different functional groups that have oxygens, right? Especially oxygen, the only one oxygen. Uh, only one oxygen. We're basically limited to aldehydes, ketones, alcohols, and ethers. We can look at this and just by looking at the, the lack of a big broad peak above 3000 tells us it's not an OH. And the fact that we know that carbonyls show up between 16 and 1800, and that they're very sharp peaks that are pretty strong. So maybe that one, but again, we would expect these to be pretty strong peaks and that's not really necessarily what we'd expect a strong peak to look like. And it's pretty low. If I go to, to the carbonyl section here, they're actually, they're all above 1700. Maybe you could get down into the high 16s if it's um, attached to an aromatic ring, but still, this figure here shows us that if we draw a line at 17 and line at 16, there's nothing close to 17 here. So it means it's not a carbonyl. So what's left if we have no alcohol and no carbonyl, what does our oxygen have to be? An ether. Basically limited to it's got to be an ether. Right, so so the IR does not tell us about where things are attached necessarily, but it definitely narrows down what functional groups are possible, especially for oxygens. All right, so, and then if we look at this, we've got, we've got one oxygen, we've got a total of 10 hydrogens, four of which are used in the benzene ring and the other are the other two uh, groups of of hydrogens have an integration of three. So basically, we've got to have two methyl groups in there, right? So on our list of things that we have to have, we have to have two CH3 groups that are different from each other. So, and we also have to have an ether, right? 
So two CH3 groups, an ether, and a benzene ring. Now, we barely even touched the carbon NMR at this point. Um, and so, and it can be kind of helpful if you can do it without looking at the, at the third piece of information, then use that to confirm what you think it is. It can be really helpful if you have two isomers you can't decide between. Um, in this case, though, there's really only one way we could set it up. R1 has got to be either a methoxy or a methyl, and R2 is the other one, right? So from the IR, we could deduce that the oxygen we know is in there, the oxygen has to be an ether because it's not a carbonyl and it's not an alcohol. We, from the integration on the proton NMR, we knew that the other two groups of hydrogens had to be CH3s. So an ether, two CH3s and a benzene ring. This is really the only way we can differentiate between them. And this gives us our two. And so now we, we're down to, OK, what can we decide 100% that this is the substitution? Or could it be um, a 2-methoxy toluene? Do we know what the substitution looks at? And that's when we're going to go back and see we know that we only have two unique groups of hydrogen. So this matches the proton NMR, but is there another one that could match the proton NMR? I, it, would be, it would be tricky if we're considering those each one unique signal, right? And this, this is the only possibility if we consider these to be one signal each. But if those peaks could be separate signals from each other, that could just be a total integration of four. You know, we, want to, we want to support this with the proton NMR. Or sorry, with the, the carbon NMR. So the carbon NMR, we can use because we say, OK, well, these ones down here, these are going to be our methoxy and our methyl. Because if we look at where the chemical shifts are, for the too many holders open at the same time, here's our carbon NMR. Our a ether or an ester carbon is going to show up down around 60. And a primary alkyl is going to show up all the way shielded. So the one all the way to the right is our methyl group. The one around 60 is our ether carbon. And then we've got aromatics that can show up in a wide range, from 100 to 160. And so all of these peaks on the left-hand side are those are all our aromatic carbons. And if you look, if we look at it, we've got a peak that's more shielded, two peaks that are really close to the same amount of shielding. So, but, and then one peak that's more deshielded. So, out of the six carbons on here, there's only four distinct types of carbon. This matches up with it, right? Because you could have directly attached to the to the methyl, adjacent to the methyl are going to be equivalent to each other. Adjacent to the ether are going to be equivalent to each other. And then you've got the one directly attached to the ether. If we change our substitution, Let's see if the other two ways of substituting this would give us something that also matches. 
how many unique carbons do we have here on the just in the aromatic region? You've still got directly attached to the ether, directly attached to the methyl. You've got in between the two. You've got adjacent to the ether, which is not the same as adjacent over here, right? Or here. So if this was our substitution, we should see six peaks in the carbon NMR, right? And so this is where carbon NMR is really, really helpful because with the proton NMR, all of our aromatic stuff is so close together. Sometimes we can't tell the peaks apart from each other, the signals apart from each other. But with the carbon NMR, that, it makes it really clear. So what's gonna happen if I, so that one, it can't be, meta relative to each other because that would give us six unique hydrogens, right? Or six unique carbons. Same here, right? We have we would have six unique hydrogens because you could have directly attached to each of the substituents. So that's two different. There's adjacent to the methyl that's not this carbon. There's adjacent to the methoxy that's not this one. So that's four right there. And then there's the two over here that are opposite of the methoxy and opposite of the methyl. So all six of these carbons would wind up showing up differently as well. So the fact that we only have four signals in the aromatic region tells us it has to be, they have to be opposite of each other. At the other place that carbon 13 NMR is really, really helpful is that with the in the proton NMR, these carbons didn't show up as a separate signal, right? Because they don't have an H plus on them. Proton NMR only shows protons by definition. And so any carbon that doesn't have a hydrogen attached to it won't show up in a carbon NMR, in a proton NMR, but they will show up in a carbon NMR. So in other words, there's, you don't have to worry about with the carbon NMR that, oh, are there protons? Maybe that one's just not showing up at all. It, every carbon will show up in a carbon NMR. Right? But what you lose is you lose the splitting and the integration. And you also lose the fact that an alcohol won't show up at all in a carbon NMR, right? because it's not carbon and we're not looking at the protons. Alcohols were tricky when we were doing proton NMR. Sometimes they coupled, sometimes they didn't, but they always showed up at least. That's not the case with carbon NMR because you need carbon for it to show up. So it still has its blind spots. And that's still a reason why we look at all three of these pieces of information. No one instrument can completely answer these questions. You have to look at them in conjunction with each other. And you have to be, pay attention to what are the blind spots and the strengths of each of them. All right, I know I went, I probably went kind of fast on some of those. Were there any specific leaps that I made that didn't make sense? Or is it a case of as long as I'm the one doing it, it all makes sense. And now when you try it on your own, you're going to get stuck. Cody? I was going to ask about that smaller peak farther down on the carbon. Yeah. Did we, oops, did we already go over that? Um, it's So remember that we can't. So one, the height of the peaks in NMR are not necessarily correlated to how strong the signal is, right? For, um, for proton NMR, we could integrate, but then we're still really just looking at the area under the curve, not necessarily the height of the, of the peak itself, right? The amplitude of the peak is kind of related to that, but you could have small broad peaks that still integrate out to one. Um, and so there are, 
there are a number of reasons why we could get a smaller signal. Um, but since we're not going to be able to integrate any of these, um, we can't really look at the size of the signal as being particularly indicative of anything for carbon-13 NMR. We're just looking for, is there a signal there? And where is it on the chemical shift? That's really all we can interpret. It's not like IR, where we're looking at that's a strong, sharp peak versus a broad peak. Doesn't tell us anything in the NMR. Could we say based off the location, it's closer to something electronegative or something like that? We can absolutely say that. So if we wanted to assign the priority, and, and this is a good way to make sure that your, your proposed structure matches, is you should be able to go through the carbon NMR and circle each of the peaks and say it, part, it applies to a specific part of your molecule. So I'll, on the board here, I will label all the carbons. Let's call the methyl carbon A, B, C, D, and E. So we can assign each of these peaks now just based on um, just based on where they are. So the one that's the most shielded, the only thing that shows up all the way down there, that's going to be peak A. Right, it's alkyl groups are more shielded than aromatic carbons, so it's all the way down there. And then we've got this peak right around 60, about act more like 55. Um, and if we if we look at our cheat sheet, our figure, uh, this one, what shows up in that? 50 to 60 region is going to be ethers. If we had a, an alcohol, the carbon attached to the alcohol would show up in the same region. Um, it could be an alkyl halide, but we don't have any halogens. So the, the only thing on our compound that matches in that area, that's going to be the, the methoxy carbon. So that's going to be E. So then all four of the other peaks, including the two that we can't tell apart, are going to be in the um, aromatic region. And so if we're trying to assign these, you're absolutely right. The one that's the furthest downfield is going to be the one directly attached to an oxygen. So that's going to be carbon D. And the one that's the most shielded is going to be the one that's directly attached to the methyl group because methyls can donate electron density. They're the opposite of electronegative, which is not electropositive. Uh, we call it electron donating instead of electron withdrawing. So that's going to be carbon. Oops, I missed the carbon when I was labeling things, didn't I? Call that F. It messes with our left to right, our right to left thing here, but the carbon F is the one that the methyl group is directly attached to. It's still in the aromatic region, but it's the most shielded of the aromatic carbons. And that means our two unresolved peaks that are really close to the same spot. They've got to be C and D. They don't have any electron donating groups directly attached, but they also don't have an oxygen directly attached. So C and D are really close together. Right, so we get two signals for those. And if we actually have the raw data, you might be able to see those two peaks on top of each other. Remember with carbon NMR, that you're not going to get any splitting. So if you have two distinct peaks that are really close together, that's not splitting, that's two different carbons. Casey? Yeah, 
Yeah, I was going to ask, what would this uh, look like as far as like the Proton NMR? So, so this is the, okay, so if we wanted to look at the Proton NMR, we would do, we can do the same thing, except we're going to want to label the distinct hydrogens, not the distinct carbons. So we can still do protons on A. Right, so our, our lettering kind of still works, C and C. Nothing there, nothing on the oxygen. So we should only have four distinct peaks, which is what we see. And we're going to go through this and do things pretty much the same way. The most shielded, this, our logic still applies just like it did for the carbon one. So the peak that's the most downfield, or sorry, the most um, shielded furthest to the right is gonna be A. D is gonna be the, it's still a CH3. And if we look at our, if we switch to the proton one, see that, alcohols and ethers, if you have an ether adjacent to a proton, that will show up in that three and a half range, three to four, which is where we're seeing it here. So this is our methoxy protons. And then C and B are going to be both up in the aromatic region. And if you can tell the two signals apart, we can use the exact same logic and just say, okay, well, the more de-shielded must be the ones that are adjacent to the ether. So that's going to be C. And these are going to be B. A lot of times, if you're looking at real data, especially on the proton NMR, because of the peak splitting and how they, they widen, you might wind up with this just being a big mess and not being able to say that's two distinct signals, in which case you would just label it like, well, I don't know if this is two distinct signals or if this is just a big mess, but I know that the overall integration is four, and I know protons B and C are in there. So just like we did below, down below, when you can't tell the two signals apart from each other, you just sit, make a note and say both of them are there. And again, this is also something that, that lends itself to multiple choice questions, even on closed book tests, right? Like the MCATs. Um, because this, I mean, just even the way we labeled it kind of kind of sets itself up to be a multiple choice question. Here's your structure. Here's the NMR spectrum. Which of these or which of these protons accounts for this signal, for signal one? And then you would have to say proton A accounts for signal one. Right? And but the logic is always going to, even if you don't have your table of NMR frequencies in front of you, NMR relies less on memorizing because it's basically like no, you know, you kind of have to know what's where the aromatics are, but at the same time, you're basically looking for do I have electron withdrawing groups or electron donating groups? Right? If they're an electron withdrawing group, it's going to be further to the left. And just to when I look at this particular NMR or IR, if I was giving, um, going to be making notes, if I was doing the same assignment, noting the absence of a peak on an IR is just as valuable as a peak that is there, right? So what matters most about this peak is the fact that there's no OH and there's no carbonyl. That was actually, that was the two most useful things about this IR. Yeah, we could get into it and we could look at it and say, okay, well, if I draw a line right at 3000, I've got peaks on either side of it. So I've got, I've got alkanes and, al and 
maybe aromatics in the same region as each other. But that was less, we already knew that from the proton NMR, right? We already knew we had a benzene ring. So don't be afraid on the IR to basically just use it to rule things out. Right, because that's what that's what I would do looking at these three spectra. My first thought would be, I know it's not an alcohol, I know it's not a carbonyl. Moving on. And then if I needed to split hairs down the road, I could come back to it and say, ah, uh, maybe that, you know, oh yeah, there isn't any peak above three thousand, so it can't be an alkane. There, there has to be something else going on. But you know, you don't need to do that when you first look at these. Okay, so when we're when we're coming to a problem, um, so the first thing to do is to look at the carbon uh, NMR, or or would you look at the um, the spectrum, whatever you're showing right here? This would be your first thing that you would look at. I like to look at the IR first because it's more limited. There's okay. less for you to actually figure out about the IR. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if the, the first thing you do, the first thing I would do is look at the formula and then and that say, okay, well, if I know I only have one oxygen, it can't be an acid, it can't be an ester. The okay. formula itself will limit things. And then the IR will further limit it. Because just from the formula, I, I had four functional groups that had oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. And then I was able to eliminate three of those four just by looking at the IR immediately following. Mm -hmm. And um, was it the NMR or the IR where anything under 1500 just ignore, right? That's the IR. Yeah. Anything, anything to the right of 1500 is the fingerprint region. Okay. And it's of dubious value at best. Um, I've, I don't think I've ever done one of these as a student or as a teacher um, where you had to read something out of the fingerprint region. Okay. So it's like, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's like astrology. Um, basically, you're going to find confirmation for whatever you already think is the case if you go into the fingerprint region. So it's just best to avoid it. Okay. All right. So if I was getting you started on the next one, Look at the formula, C6H14O2. O2 tells me I've got two oxygens. They may be the same function group, but they might not be. And then I've got a big broad peak on the IR. Not broad enough to be a carboxylic acid because a carboxylic acid would go all the way down to, the 20, to about 2,500. And so right off the bat, I know one of my oxygens at least is an alcohol, maybe both of them. But I know it's not a carboxylic acid. And look in that 16 or that 1700 region too, there's nothing up here, right? So I know it's not a carboxylic acid and it's nothing that's a carbonyl, which means we're basically limited to alcohols and ethers. So it might be a diol where it has two OHs. It might be an ether and an alcohol, but it's gonna be some combination of those two. And then when we start looking down here, the, and the other thing about the formula we can look at is that tells us if it's saturated or not too, right? If it's C6H14, it can't be a benzene ring without even looking at the NMR or anything else. It can't be a benzene ring because it's saturated. So we're dealing with all single bonds. So I guess we didn't even need to, to consider carbonyls either, just based on the formula. We're dealing with all single bonds. We're dealing with um, at least one alcohol maybe two alcohols. It could be an alcohol and an ether, or it could be two alcohols. And that limits our, our options a lot, right? Because we can't even have a ring structure. So 
there are a lot of different ways you can arrange that still. And that's where the NMR is going to come in. Look at all the different types of signals we have here. And so figuring out, okay, where do I put a methyl versus not is going to really come into play here based on splitting and the integration. And the fact that we have one, two, three, four, five, six different signals in the carbon NMR. And we only had six carbons total, right? So all of our carbons are going to be unique. All right, so I'm going to stop ta talking and let you guys try and work out the rest of this for now. Um, but if you want me to check an answer, if you want to work, walk through it once you think you have an answer, um, I will turn it over to you guys to present it to each other if you want, um, or just talk through it and make sure that what you're saying makes sense. Again, it's just more practice with, with the same. And that, uh, so that Poisoner's Handbook book that I was talking about this morning that I finished reading, it's all about the wet chemistry. Um, and it gets, it gets a little graphic in places. Take one and a half ounces of brain matter and grind it in a mortar and pestle and then boil it and distill the condensation. And then you can test for arsenic uh, or whatever the toxin is that you're looking at. Um, but uh, most stuff like that, most toxicology these days is all done with dry chemistry with, with instruments like this. So yes, you're losing out on some of the historical aspect of it, but what you would actually be doing if you got a job as a toxicologist or as a medical examiner would be looking at spectra like this these days, unless the power goes out. If you're in Texas right now, then maybe you're going back to wet chemistry, um, but odds are you're probably still just calling in sick. Let's, let's be real, right? All right, I'll let you guys start working on this. Let me know when you want, or just start talking to each other when you want to talk stuff out. I was just going to say, I think they have to use wet chemistry to test for rabies too, to check the brain, right? For animals, I think anyway. I, I'll, so a lot of the biological testing will still be some wet chemistry. Even stuff like PCR testing, like for COVID is still, you still have to have a sample and then you have to, to amplify it and do some actual, some actual hands-on chemistry and microbio with it. Um, mostly because you're dealing with such small samples a lot of times, um, and you're dealing with living organisms, things get a little bit more complicated, um, because you can't tell if it's, especially if it's a bacterial infection like rabies, you can't tell the difference between without getting in there and actually looking at the individual proteins, you can't tell the difference between a rabies cell and an E. coli cell, for, for instance. So that's when you need to let those samples grow a little bit more. And then there are other tests you can do. If you've had microbiome, um, you've probably learned like testing for gram positive versus gram negative strains of bacteria. There's other tests similar to that is what you would be doing for um, other types of bacteria or viral infection. 
Hey, Sean. Yeah. Um, so I decided just to, I was struggling with 63, so I'm moving on to 67, but um, I, I'm looking at this IR um, for 67 and the peak at uh, 3000, would you, would that be weak or would that be medium? I, those, so we know that anything with carbons and hydrogens, you're going to see peaks right around there. So we, we sh know we should be looking for it. Um, mm -hmm. And don't be afraid. You might need to, if you're not printing it out, you might actually want to get out a, a piece of paper anyway and hold it up to give yourself a ruler to see exactly what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, or if you have a um, a tool that'll let you draw a straight vertical line. You can do that. So mm -hmm. I, I would say that those are, those are at least medium, mostly because we know that we, we are always going to have peaks right around 3000. So it's less about how strong they are mm -hmm. and more about, are they left of the line at 3000 or right of the line at 3000? And right, this one's right. So there's peaks on both sides, right? Though, really, right? Right. Yeah. So that, that means that you've got some carbon hydrogen bonds that are sp3 and some carbon hydrogen bonds that are sp2. Okay. SP2. So in other words, you've got alkene or benzene, and you've also got some alkane in there too. Okay. Which one's right is sp2? Um, so higher energy means that there's stiffer springs, which is going to be the sp2. If you have if you have lines to the left of 3000, mm -hmm. that's going to be SP2. If you have lines to the right of 3000, that's going to be SP3. Okay. Although I would double check that just because I'm doing that off of memory. Yeah, alkenes are 3000 to 3100. Okay.
Sean, on 67, what on the carbon um, NMR, um, what, what's the deal with that solvent? What does that mean? Um, sometimes, sometimes based on how we made something or, um, or what we have to do to get it to dissolve, because these things, NMRs only work if you have, um, if they're in liquid or in, in a solution. And so sometimes mm -hmm. the solvent can't get rid of it entirely. Mm -hmm. um, but if you know what your solvent is, you can say, okay, well, I know that say acetone always has these three peaks show up in a carbon NMR and you just label them and just as being solvent and ignore them. Mm -hmm. So the fact that a solvent just means it's not part of the molecule you're looking at, but you don't have to do anything with them. Okay, so there's, so for 67, we're only concerned with five carbons. Bingo. Okay. So Sean, what's the deal with double bond equivalents? Is that, have you gone over that um, formula? Is that a thing that we're gonna use? Um, you are, are you, you're not looking at something specifically in the um, No, I'm just, no, I'm just Googling <laughs> how to approach these problems. And that's they're talking about that. Um, so double bond equivalents, it looks like I that's not a term that I'm familiar with, but it looks like it's re related to just how unsaturated it is, what degree of unsaturation. Mm -hmm. So remember, for every pair of hydrogens that's missing, mm -hmm. you have either a pi bond or you have a ring. Okay, so, so if I pair per carbon, it should so, be double. Yeah. So a, it should be double plus two. Okay. Because if you think about it, every if it's a straight chain carbon, mm -hmm. every carbon has two hydrogens, right? If it's in the middle of the chain. Yeah. But then the carbons at the end still have those two 
the carb or two hydrogens plus one extra on each of the ends. Okay. So if you have N carbons, mm -hmm. if it's saturated, it will be two N plus two hydrogens. It'll be, it'll be okay. H2. H2. N plus two, okay. And so that that's that's how I knew for for the second example that was mm -hmm. it was C six H fourteen O O two I think, um, but that doesn't matter. Oxygens don't affect the degree of uh, degree of unsaturation. Mm -hmm. So two N would be twelve hydrogens, right? Right. So two N plus two means it's saturated, which means no pi bonds. And it also means no rings. Okay. So, so for every pair it's missing out of that 2n plus 2, mm -hmm. that's either a pi bond or a ring. Okay. So for each pair it's missing. Okay, so then for 67, we're missing two or no. We're, yeah, missing two pairs. Correct, because if it was saturated, it would be, it would be C six H, fourteen. Okay. So the fact that that is C six H ten, you're missing two pairs, which means a ring. You, you either have two rings, which would be really unlikely if it's C six, right? You can't really get two rings out of six carbons. Mm -mm. So, but you could have cyclohexene. So it could be a ring and a pi bond, or it could be two pi bonds. Okay. Hey, Sean, question. Yeah, hit me. Would you mind going over the peak splitting and the uh, integration number for HNMR? Yeah, so the, the integration is, that's integration in the sense of, um, of the calculus meaning of integration. So it's where you're looking at the area under each peak. Let me get the um, slides pulled up that I was, that I had earlier. So uh, so the, yeah, so it's the integral of each signal is proportional to the number of protons in that signal. And so a lot of times you'll just see them written as, as whole numbers. Um, the integral of this whole section here, the area under the entire curve, is two relative to the threes over here, right? So it's basically how many protons are in each of the signals. So, and sometimes you just, it's just given to you like this. I think all the problems for this one, they've assigned the numbers for you. So you don't actually have to measure them yourself, but you could, this red line is just showing the area under the curve. So you could actually measure and say, okay, well this height, relative to this height is roughly three times as large. So if we call this this one one, an integral of one, this one would have an integral of three. And this looks like it's halfway in between the two. So it's probably an integral of two. Does that make sense? Where you're just looking at, it's it's physically going to tell you how many hydrogens are in each signal versus the, the peak splitting doesn't tell you how many 
protons are, are in each signal. They tell you about how many protons are next door. Um, so in that case, you're basically saying, okay, if you have a singlet, that means that that's a peak that's not split at all. That means that none of the carbons attached to the to this carbon, none of the carbons next door have any protons attached to them. Because it, it follows this n plus one rule where basically the, the number of carbons next door is gonna affect how many different ways you can flip these. If you think of these as being coins that can be heads or tails, the number of different hydrogens next door is gonna affect how many different ways you can flip the, the protons on your signal. That you're thinking about right now. And so it follows that n plus one rule. Um, because if you have if you have one hydrogen next door, there's they can either be pointed the same way or they can be pointed opposite ways. So there's two different peaks that show up in the same signal because they can either match or not. If there are two hydrogens next door, then you get a triplet because you could have them both facing the same way. You could have all three of them facing the same way. You could have two of them facing up and one down, or you could have two of them facing down and one up, which are going to be equivalent signals, or you could have them all facing down. And so you, it, it comes from the probability and the statistics of how many different ways can we arrange these, which is why they kind of look like a bell curve. Um, and so when you're looking at the assignment, and you're looking at the proton NMRs, let's say we're looking at 64. So the blue numbers are telling you the integration and the peak splitting tells you how many things are attached next door. So for instance, this one that's furthest to the left, because that's the one that's it's easy to tell that's two different signals or that that's a separate signal from everything else. Um, it's got an integration of two, which means there's two protons attached to that specific carbon that are get generating the signal, and that there are car two carbons attached to something next door because it's split into three peaks. Something like these down here, that's one, two, three, four, five, and anything above five, it gets a little bit hard to tell because sometimes the, the peaks wind up being really, really small and getting lost in the noise. But you know, you've got, if it's got five peaks that you can definitively see, you know that there's at least four nearest neighbors. And it has an integral of two. So that, that could be a carbon that looks like If you had a CH2 and then on either side of it was another CH2, the ones in red would be your nearest neighbors, right? So the integration of two tells you that the carbon, the black carbon has two protons on it. And the peak splitting of five tells you that there's at least four hydrogens next door. Does that make sense? It's it's two different pieces of information that are really easy to get mixed up with. So what would you say about the one that that peak that's at uh, two point four? So a couple things. One, since we know that this is something that has that has ox has an alcohol in it. Alcohols, when you have oxygens, the fact that you've got, a, instead of having a carbon-carbon bond between them, you have a carbon-oxygen bond, they don't couple as well. So you don't always see any peak splitting if it's an alcohol peak. If it's an alcohol proton, you might not see any peak splitting. So I haven't looked, I have not looked at the answer to this one, but if I had to guess, I'd say that's an alcohol proton and that doesn't necessarily mean that there's no hydrogens attached to the carbon it's, atta it's attached to because alcohols behave differently because carbon and oxygen are just not the same nucleus. Um, and therefore you can't trust the, the peak splitting. Does 
what about the smashed up peak at uh, 3.5? Because there's two integral numbers. There are two integral numbers, even if you consider that to be if you consider that to be all one signal, you still have an integral of four, right? So whether it's two signals or not, they're, they're really close to the same amount of shielding and it would add up to a total of four protons. So I wouldn't necessarily tr look at that one and try to turn that into, it, it might be that you could look at that as two doublets, but I wouldn't try to read too much into the peak splitting until you're pretty sure that you already know what your figure, what your, structure is the more you can you can figure it out based on everything else and the less you have to rely on peak splitting the better because it's the most fickle of the of the information on the proton nmr right.
Hey, Casey. Hey, man, what's up? I was just going to see if you got anything for that first one. Maybe we can compare what we got. Are you talking about 15.6? Uh, 0.63, yeah. OK. So far, I've been working on it. Um, what do you have? I feel like based off of um, the uh, Proton NMR. I feel like those first three peaks are probably like a propyl group. Like maybe we got three carbons in a row. And then I'm thinking maybe on the fourth carbon, we've got the hydroxide. And then the next carbon over, I think is like an oxygen for like an ether. And then like an ethyl group on the other side of that. I don't know if that makes sense. I was thinking about that. Um... I kind of had similar what you had, but I had the like an ether in the middle, and then instead of an isopropyl group, I had more of a uh, just a propane on one side, and then propane on the other, and then an alcohol hanging off to the first carbon. An alcohol on the primary, okay. Yeah, I'm trying to see what I can do to be more confident about it. <laughs> I don't really know. Hey, I'm in the same boat with you, man. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, when I was yeah. looking at the... What's that? A hint? And I'll yeah. let you... I'm, this is good. I like hearing you guys work it out together. You've got one... You only have one carbon that has an integration of three. So right? likely only one methyl group? Or a methyl group that doesn't have... You have to have two ends of a carbon chain, right? Right. So on one end, you could have a CH3, but then on the other end of the carbon group, you've got to have something else attached. So a primary alcohol would kind of fit the bill on that one, wouldn't it? It would, yeah. And then that, that accounts for all of the twos that you see in there? To see if that gives you something to work with. Sounds like you're approaching it the right way, Casey. Hey, you had a good start too. I appreciate it, man. <laughs> that would make sense that it was a primary alcohol because the proton NMR with the two would be closer to the electronegative L oxygen or whatever. So yeah, man, I think you're right about that one. I was thinking at least with it I started getting nice. confused by those little peaks with the on the uh, 3.5 on proton when they start smashing together yeah I had that that same question about the the is that two peaks that are separated or is that just one I think it's just supposed to be four protons total which was why I was given that propane and then the primary alcohol off of it, but. Yeah, sounds like your your brain's working properly for this kind of stuff, man. I hope so, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to call that one good. Move on to the next one, man. Touch base with you here in a little bit. Sounds good, man. Cool. Thanks.